Good afternoon, everyone. It's always uh, very nice to be back home, so thank you for the opportunity. I have no disclosures. This is the outline of what we will be talking about today. Um, and I'm going to begin by talking about what I think is a crazy challenge. You know, as we all know, the burden of sickle cell disease is concentrated in this continent. It's estimated that 300,000 babies are born with sickle cell every, every year. And while we don't have enough data, it's estimated at least 50% of those children will die by the age of five. However, our friends in the US, Europe, Jamaica, and uh, some other Caribbean nations have really figured out how to fix this problem through newborn, newborn screening, as well as various uh, evidence-based um, interventions such as penicillin. And so we really know what to do, so it's not really a, a that crazy, and it's Elliot who's running on Sunday. It's only crazy until you do it. So I think we just need to just need to do it to uh, implement these changes. So the pathophysiology of uh, sickle cell nephropathy. Uh, you know the kidneys are very interesting, and we all know that the the root of all evil in sickling process in sickle sickle cell disease is a sickling process, and uh, the renal medulla is an ideal environment for this, which. It's very hypoxic, it's very low oxygen tension, it's acidotic, and it's dehydrated. And that is an ideal environment for a sickling process. And it is thought that these recurrent um, sickling episodes can lead to ischemic perfusion injury, vasculopathy, and glomerular damage. At the same time, in response to this medullary ischemia, cortical renal blood flow is increased, and GFR is, in, is, is increased as well. And as we know from conditions such as diabetes, hyperfiltration, subsequently, subsequent hyperfiltration leads to proteinuria and glomerulosclerosis. And that's the, our understanding of uh, sickle cell nephropathy. So this slide here shows um, my understanding or my interpretation of sickle cell nephropathy. So it slowly developed insidiously over time. And starting in childhood, and I'm not a uh, pediatric nephrologist, um, but uh, hyperfiltration um, then progresses to um, microalbuminuria. And most people would actually stop here, most people do not progress to um, ESRD, but a subset, will, a subset of uh, patients will progress to having severe albuminuria or called uh, macroalbuminuria, progressive CKD and ESRD. <coughs> and at the same time, because of recurrent uh, sickling episodes and other illnesses, um, these patients are predisposed to recurrent uh, episodes of AKI, and we know that recurrent AKI can also lead to progressive uh, kidney disease. So let me start by talking about uh, infants. So this is a uh, hypoxenuria, which is inability to concentrate your urine. It's a universal finding in sickle cell, sickle cell patients, and it leads to uh, nocturia and aneurysis. So this is a study from, from the US and is looking at the prevalence of uh, aneurysis and nocturia. And you can see even uh, teenagers up to 20, you can have people having uh, um, <coughs> aneurysis and also nocturia, even at this uh, late, uh, late age. Interestingly, it's reversible by transfusions and hydroxyurea in children, but with progressive damage to the kidney, it actually becomes irreversible with age. But there's some data to, sh to suggest that, you know, ACE inhibition or ARBs can help with nocturia, probably from reducing the GFR. What about hyperfiltration? So again, this is commonly seen um, in sickle cell patients. And this study here is a baby hug study, which was uh, a study of infants uh, looking at the effect of hydroxyurea. And they, they actually measured um, 
GFR using technetium. So this is measured GFR, and it showed that over 50% of infants had really high GFR, some of them up to 200. So hyperfiltration is also a common finding um, in sickle cell disease uh, patients. A follow-up of that study, or an extens actually a follow-up of, uh, of this study is the Hustle study, which also looking, this study was looking at infants, but this one was looking at children and uh, adults up to 30 years, and they again showed that these participants had pre very much uh, elevated GFR, um, higher than you would expect from uh, um, um, the, the general population. However, starting age 30 to 40, uh, then GFR, because of this recurrent renal injury, renal damages, it just starts to, to decline. <coughs> So let me talk about um, albuminuria. So again, uh, it's a very common problem. So this is microalbuminuria, seen in about, this is in a uh, cohort of, uh, several cohorts and mostly in the US. 21% of children have microalbuminuria. Almost 70% of adults have microalbuminuria. Progresses to macro in about 40% of adults by age 40. So really high numbers. Now nephrotic syndrome, nephrotic range proneuria in the setting of you know, patients with sickle cell disease, it's not that common, it's rare. In, in fact, um, when it's seen, usually it suggests another condition. So remember, just because you have sickle cell does not mean you cannot have another kidney process. So when uh, uh, the studies were done looking at nephrotic uh, range proneuria in patients with sickle cell disease, there was usually another explanation for that outside of sickle cell. So briefly mentioned hematuria. Um, this is from microinfarcts in the renal papillae, which can lead to painless uh, hematuria, painless but visible hematuria. Now, if you have a large infarct, that can lead to a large papillary necrosis and uh, painful, um, sort of obstructive uh, clot. It's usually self-limiting, just hydration, bed rest, pain relief, and it goes away. However, um, also seen in uh, sickle cell trait, this is a rare um, cancer that's very aggressive, so medullary cell carcinoma. Um, and I put this here to suggest to mention that you know when we see a hematuria, hematuria in a sickle cell patient, it's always good to think about this. Um, it's very rare, but it's very uh, aggressive tumor. <coughs> so pause and uh, talk about management. And I'll begin by highlighting the issues with measuring kidney function in sickle cell disease. So up to 30% of uh, total creatinine excretion is from tuberous secretion. So you're going to have an overestimation of GFR in, um, uh, in sickle cell patients, which is a problem. And serum cystatin C, uh, several studies have mentioned or have shown that it may be a, a more accurate uh, measurement of uh, kidney function. However, <clears throat> at this point, we don't have um, it's not widely available. The ass, some of the assays are not as standardized as creatinine. Um, and so I think right now we are stuck with serum creatinine. And one way to get away from this, um, or to deal with this, is to really focus on these, uh, the change in GFR, so the GFR slope instead of the absolute value. And if, for example, I have, I'm giving you a um, young woman here who's 20. Creatinine is uh, 0.4. To, goes from 0.4 to 9, so doubling of creatinine. And you can see that this GFR went from 167 to 106. So this is a number by itself that may not ca catch your attention, but if you uh, realize that they lost, this is a huge loss to go from 167 to 106. So at this point, as long as we're stuck with creatinine, we should look at um, the change. So next, uh, slide, I'm going to talk about specific therapies, um, and I'm going to sort of focus on evidence-based uh, therapies that we have. And what I mean by evidence-based, this is it. This is the only one that um, have specifically looked at sickle cell anemia. And this is a study that was done almost 21 years ago. Um, 
and this is in one of the islands here. Um, it is a, a double-blind, randomized controlled trial looking at uh, captopril for patients with sickle cell disease and microalbuminuria. Interesting, they only included 22 patients, um, and. Uh, the dose of captopril was ultimately uh, 25 milligram, starting at 6.25, <clears throat> and then escalated over time. So what did this study show? So this is the, their main findings here. Uh, this is on the y-axis is uh, albuminuria, x-axis is time, so this is a six-month study. You can see that the placebo arm, which is uh, the dotted line, had about 107 um, milligram per 24 hours of albuminuria, and this is the treatment arm. And you can see that over time, as you would expect with captopril or ACE inhibition, pronuria went down by 37%. And as I mentioned, based on natural history of sickle cell nephropathy, the placebo arm uh, had an increase of 17% in pronuria. So based largely on this study and some other observational data, uh, or non-controlled uh, data, uh, it was widely accepted that regardless of blood pressure, all patients who have sickle cell and pronuria should really be in an ACE inhibitor. <clears throat> and that's really all the therapy, all the evidence that we know about uh, targeted therapy that is focusing directly on uh, sickle cell. So what I'll talk about is sort of disease modifying um, therapy that is targeting um, the sickle cell disease itself. And starting with hydroxyurea, and this is a complicated slide, but it's a nice uh, review that was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine showing uh, the effect of hydroxyurea. <coughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned that <coughs> the root of all evil in, sickling, in sickle cell disease is this sickling process that leads to hemolysis, uh, sickling crisis, inflammation, anemia, pain, all these issues that are starting from, uh, from the sickling here. And hydroxyurea works by increasing uh, hemo fetal hemoglobin that blocks this process. We also know that uh, it can also um, help with inflammation and decrease uh, neutrophil. So it helps this inflammation part of um, of the process. So the question was, um, you know, hydroxyurea had been used for over 30 years outside of Africa, outside of in the US, Europe, and uh, the Caribbean, but there always um, were questions about the applicability of uh, hydroxyurea in the continent uh, of Africa. And, and the hypothesis here was that some in vitro studies have shown that uh, hydroxyurea can worsen uh, severe malaria. So there was some uh, <coughs> safety concerns regarding using hydroxyurea in the continent. And also, um, because hydroxyurea induces a neutral, um, would decrease your neutrophils, there were some concerns that people, uh, kids who get, or adults who get uh, infection may not be um, uh, able to deal with it in the setting of hydroxyurea. So this study was uh, done in Uganda. It's called uh, No Harm. And it's a novel use of hydroxyurea in uh, an African region with malaria. It was done in Kampala, and their goal, this was uh, also a placebo-controlled trial looking at the effect of uh, hydroxyurea in, uh, in African children, in Ugandan children. Interestingly, which I guess is good, so over a year there were only five malaria episodes um, in the treatment arm, and then the placebo arm was seven episodes. So really, the, their main um, primary outcome, which is uh, the effect of hydroxyurea on, um, on malaria, was negative. There was no difference between these two treatment arms. But what was interesting is that, as you would expect, and as we already knew from other studies outside of the continent, is that hydroxyurea decreases phaso occlusive crisis compared to placebo, and also hospitalization. So this was not, not unexpected. But still, the question remained, um, as I mentioned, the incidence of malaria was quite low in Uganda, and so the argument was made that um, we need to do this study in higher malaria uh, uh, areas. And so the 
follow-up study, which was recently published at uh, the beginning of the year, um, it's called REACH, so Realizing Effectiveness Across Continents with Hydroxyurea. It's a study uh, that was done in uh, Uganda, um, Kenya, and Kilifi, which is not too far from here, um, and DRC, and also in Angola. And again, they were looking at the effect of hydroxyurea uh, in, in people with malaria, in children with malaria. Um, <coughs> sorry, in children with sickle cell. And again, uh, not really surprising. Uh, hydro this is, was not a placebo-controlled trial because it, was not, it wouldn't have been ethical at this point, knowing what we know about hydroxyurea, to really get, do a placebo-controlled study. Um, sickle cell events decreased malaria decreased. So again, uh, there had been previous concerns that hydroxyurea can worsen malaria. Uh, but here we are seeing decreased uh, rates of, of malaria, which is wonderful. Uh, uh, Vasoocclusive occlusive pain, again, decreased. Transfusion decreased. So really excellent outcomes. But the one that I uh, really like is this one here. Um, <coughs> so death dropped quite rapidly. And so in, a, in an editorial that accompanied this, uh, this article that came out, uh, made this statement that I think I agree with, um, is that hydroxyurea should be given to all, all children with um, sickle cell disease in Africa. All of them. So again, I go back to this gentleman here. You know, when I read that, I thought it was a crazy idea, but it's really not crazy. We just, just need to do it. Um, so again, we go back to what is the effect of hydroxyurea specifically for sickle cell nephropathy. We know it works for sickle cell disease as a modifying disease agent, but what about the effect of sickle cell in um, kidney disease? So the baby hug trial, again, this is a US-based trial. Um, they did not see any effect on hyperfiltration. At the end of the trial, there was still hyper, hyperfiltration. They did see improved concentration abilities, or improved uh, hyposthenuria that we saw previously. And then by measuring kidney size, there was decreased uh, enlargement. The follow-up study, again called HUSL, um, they did see some reduced hyperinfiltration among older children. And the argument that was made here is that we really did not follow these children long enough to see an effect. Um, and then there was a, a cross-sectional study out of North Carolina that was uh, looked at sickle cell adults. And there was a suggestion that hydroxyurea may uh, decrease albuminuria. But again, this was not a trial. This is a cross-sectional study. So at this point, um, Really, the data is not clear, but to me, this suggests that this is an opportunity for uh, clinical studies, especially here in the continent. <coughs> the next intervention that is done uh, <coughs> for sickle cell disease is transfusions. Um, and really, the data has been conflicting about the effect on, on albuminuria. And while you consider long-term complication, yesterday we heard from a uh, South African nephrologist, I forget her name, about really trying to minimize uh, transfusion for children um, because of alloimmunization, which really affects their uh, transplant candidacy. So at this point, uh, given there's really no data and uh, <clears throat> it's more risky, you know, transfusion really is not recommended specifically if your goal is to improve kidney disease outcomes. Obviously, there are other indications for transfusions in the setting of sickle cell, and that is, uh, that's different. So I'm briefly going to mention uh, the newest kid on the block for sickle cell. Um, <clears throat> and this is a uh, drug here called uh, Voxelator. And it's, you see the molecule here? It's a, um, it reversibly binds uh, hemoglobin and stabilizes hemoglobin at uh, uh, <coughs> oxygenated, oxygenated state. And with that mechanism, it lowers sickling, hemolysis, and anemia. And recently, sort of like last month, uh, in August, their findings were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and uh, this was, again, a placebo-controlled trial of people with uh, sickle, cell, sickle cell disease. And I'll show you the table one here. Um, the reason why I'm showing you this is to Again, see this North America, Europe. Uh, here, when I saw the study, I was 
praying that this other includes some of our um, countries here, um, but only Egypt was included in this uh, in this study. So again, there's this imbalance between where the burden is and where the clinical trials are happening, which is something that we, we really need to change. But anyways, this is the findings. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, how many people had, what percentage of people had a hemoglobin response, which was defined as an increase of at least one uh, uh, in the hemoglobin. And you can see in the 1,500 milligram uh, arm, there's a 59%, almost 60% uh, response. A little bit less for the lower dose. And then placebo, obviously, and nine, 9%. So this uh, was a sort of a, a great response um, that they were uh, they were studying, uh, and then there's another graph here showing the overall the mean hemoglobin response over time. So it's over 24 weeks uh, from baseline, and you can see here there's a um, statistically significant uh, increase in hemoglobin. So this is a very promising uh, drug, um, but then again, you know, when I see this kind of a study that did not include uh, uh, people from the continent, I just pause and wonder how long we're going to wait till this is tested in Africa. Uh, we waited 30 years for hydroxyurea, and I hope that we don't wait another 30 for this drug. Um, next uh, <coughs> slide is uh, briefly just going to mention this. This is just I think interesting and cool. Um, basically, it's curative therapy. So we know that sickle cell disease, the defect is in, um, uh, it's a genetic defect. Um, so with stem cell transplant, you can actually you can actually cure the disease, but you need um, a donor for that, and you need a lot a whole lot of uh, uh, expertise. And then the newest thing that's being tried now is a currently a trial happening um, is genetic editing, so genetic-based uh, curative uh, strategies, basically fixing the defect, which is uh, very interesting. Um, so remember, uh, in the beginning, we mentioned that uh, a, 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 a number of people do progress to uh, kidney disease. And this is some of the data that we have about, uh, from the US. So 12% of uh, hemoglobin patients, uh, of sickle cell patients, um, progress to kidney failure with very young, so 37 years. Um, and in this study, um, by powers, 10 to 14 percent, or 11 percent, actually, in this study, uh, deaths were attributed to sickle cell. And in Jamaica, this is a, a cohort uh, from this reference here that have been followed for many years. And those people who uh, were lucky enough to live beyond 60 years, um, 45 percent ultimately died because of in the setting of kidney disease. So. Briefly mentioned uh, kidney transplantation. Um, this, as it is the case for other uh, end uh, stage kidney diseases, this offers the best survival for patients with sickle cell disease who have end stage kidney disease. And in the uh, in the U.S., um, a Patients who had uh, kidney failure in the setting of uh, sickle cell disease and received a kidney transplant, the overall survival was 67%. Seven-year uh, survival was 67%, which is compared to 14% uh, if you remained on, on dialysis. And this is um, two slides from uh, Ojo that looked at UR URS, URSDS uh, data. Uh, and it's showing three-year allograph survival comparing sickle cell patient, African Americans with sickle cell versus uh, ESRD from another cause. And you can see that um, these numbers are quite comparable, although over time sickle cell patients do, do a little bit worse. But for most... <laughs> For most majority of this time, these data are really comparable. And again, looking at overall survival here, again, comparing sickle cell versus other causes of kidney disease uh, over three years, a little bit less uh, survival here for sickle cell patients. But when you compare this again to uh, patients who did not receive transplant, uh, the, these patients are doing much, much, much better. So kidney transplantation in the setting of end-stage kidney disease and uh, sickle cell are real, is really the, the thing to do. So in summary, I think that 
it's unacceptable that sickle cell disease remain, mortality remains so high because we know how to fix it. Just really need to do it. The only study that we have in specific for sickle cell nephropathy is a captopril study that I showed you. So RAS inhibition improves albuminuria. What we don't know is we've actually ha that changes the natural course of kidney failure, but we know that proneuria is a good marker of uh, progression, so it makes sense that if you reduce this, you're going to reduce kidney failure. It's unclear whether sickle cell disease modifying therapies have benefit for sickle cell nephropathy, but we know they have a great benefit for sickle cell disease in general, and therefore um, we should really strive to get at least hydroxyurea for all patients who have sickle cell disease. And again, we just saw that transplantation offers the best chance for survival in uh, patients who have renal failure in the setting of sickle cell disease. And then there are newer sickle cell disease modifying agents that are, agents that are emerging, but we really, really, really need to find a way to get them uh, to Africa. And that is it.